The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. So with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful freedom and privilege to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and may we have the concentration necessary to assimilate this portion of the word of God into the seven compartments of our stream of consciousness. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I have an article here that's a couple days old. It has to do with the EBT program, that's food stamps, and the fact that over the holiday weekend, Columbus Day, uh, the EBT card system went down. It says here, and I'm going to read the article just uh, to let you know, how the country has changed in just the past four years. And uh, I don't recognize it when I wake up in the morning. It's a very sad fact. And the reasons why we'll get to in a moment. Louisiana officials are trying to decide what to do about a massive shopping spree by families on food stamps when a power outage lifted the caps on their spending cards. Police were called to Walmart locations in Mansfield, Louisiana and Spring Hill, Louisiana on Saturday as shoppers cleaned out store shelves. Spring Hill Police Chief Will Lind said some customers were pushing more food than any household could store in a refrigerator and freezer. I saw people drag out 8 to 10 grocery carts, he said. Lind said customers were, quote, not unruly. There were no fights or arrests made, but the scene was still chaotic, he said. It was definitely worse than Black Friday. It was worse than anything we had ever seen in this town, Lynn said of Spring Hill, which is near the border with Arkansas. There was no food left on any of the shelves and no meat left. The grocery part of Walmart was totally decimated. He said one customer made about $700 in food purchases. Lynn said that around 9 p.m. Central Time on Saturday, a Walmart employee made an announcement on the intercom saying that the computer system had been restored and uh, card limits had returned. At that time, customers left shopping carts full of food in store aisles. At that point in time, they knew the jig was up and they couldn't purchase what they wanted to, Lynn said. In the Walmart store in Mansfield, about 80 miles south of Spring Hill, staff temporarily closed the store to new customers to prevent a fire hazard with the existing number of shoppers. Mansfield Chief of Police Gary Hobbs said no arrests were made and there were no incidents besides customers, quote, pushing and shoving, end quote. Hobbs said there were reports that customers were checking out with six to eight shopping carts, then returning in the day to purchase more. Unlike Walmart, other grocery stores in town told customers they would not accept EBT cards until the card limits were evident again, Hobbs said. The Department of Agriculture, which administers the food stamp program, said the issue was not related to the government shutdown. The Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services spokesman Trey Williams said the agency is meeting today to discuss how to handle the issue. The shopping frenzy was triggered when the electronic benefits transfer system went down because a backup generator failed at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time Saturday during a regularly scheduled test, according to Xerox, a vendor for the EBT system and based in Norwalk, Connecticut. The outage allowed recipients to spend unlimited amounts of money because the spending limit was removed for their EBT cards. The EBT system was affected in 17 states where individuals and households access programs like Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, and other programs. The loss of power triggered a preventative shutdown of the EBT system to protect its overall integrity, according to a statement from Xerox spokesman Kevin Lightfoot. <coughs> Quote, while the system was restored within 22 minutes, the network experienced 
connectiv connectivity issues until the technical staff were able to reestablish full access just before 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Lynn said the Springfield or uh, Spring Hill Walmart store manager called police on Saturday morning to ask for advice over crowd control. When he arrived, Lynn told the Walmart staff that they had the right to refuse service if they chose to. The Walmart's corporate office advised the store to allow customers to purchase what they wanted with the cards. A spokesman for Walmart, Kayla Whaling, said the frenzied shopping in Louisiana was isolated and is not representative of what our stores experienced across the country. Xerox said it continues to investigate the issue, etc. And uh, then they go on to continue that uh, the limits were restored and uh, everything went back to, more, to normal and Walmart had no more response concerning the issue. Uh, the only reason I read the article was to bring up the fact of, the, of the, just the overwhelming number of people receiving food assistance. And it is, uh, I don't necessarily blame the, the people who uh, get on the program because everything's so expensive now anyway. And uh, so they offer it to the working poor and uh, those families who are working poor, they uh, actually send around mailers and they'll call them up and say, hey, you qualify, uh, you get some free food. And so people say, well, I need free food, uh, I'll take it. But it's all by design to uh, make people dependent upon government. And that is not the way our system was founded. But that's the direction in which we've been going. And uh, we are facing a tremendous amount of debt. We have to borrow to pay the interest on the debt. That's what this whole fiasco is about right now. We can't pay our bills. It's just now starting to become a reality to government and uh, that's why the whole shutdown thing along with Obamacare and everything else uh, related to that uh, as far as uh, the government just being way too large and spending our future away and it's doing it at such a rapid rate that it's uh, going to cause widespread havoc much sooner than people expect and uh, what they're doing today is to simply put off, kick the can down the road for m until around Christmas time, and then we get to go through the whole thing all over again. But um, the reason why we have to go over through the whole thing all over again is because we spend so much money so quickly that there's a law on the books that says you, the government can only borrow this much money. Now it's up to uh, over 17 trillion. And so they lift it by half, uh, let's say half a trillion. Then when they run out of half a trillion, they have to lift the law again in order to borrow more. And we are in such a terrible situation. Our country is on the brink of total destruction. And I don't like to say it, but it's true. I am a patriot and I don't want to see it happen, but. Uh, Unfortunately, unless believers get with the Word of God, unless they stop with their distractions and get back to their first love, a lot of people started with doctrine and have fallen away. And that's the real problem. It's not politics. So it's the distractions uh, that have were distracted from the greatest freedom ever given, and that's the freedom living inside of God's power sphere or living the unique spiritual life. And we've gone over some of these distractions, such as negative volition to Bible doctrine. You can be distracted just uh, because you're negative to the Word, or you only come to the Word on occasion, usually when uh, times are rough for you. And so as a result, uh, you'll, uh, when times are bad, you'll nod to God. But that's just simple negative volition to, toward doctrine. And it doesn't have to be antagonism toward doctrine. It could be just indifference. Then there's lack of spiritual self-esteem. And that's a part of what we studied last time. If you haven't heard that, it's on the internet. Uh, part of that uh, was done <clears throat> uh, during last week during a time when I was trying to uh, put out as, as many messages as possible as I knew there would be a hiatus. 
So uh, there's the lack of spiritual self-esteem. And what happens when the believer has a lack of spiritual self-esteem is hypersensitivity. And hypersensitivity means you're hypersensitive toward self, insensitive toward others, meaning that uh, you may be offended very easily, but uh, you have no problem offending others. And that's the hypersensitivity of the subjective arrogance in life, which often leads to projection, to project your own arrogance onto someone else. And all of that is related to a lack of spiritual self-esteem that uh, we went over in the last message. There's the ignorance or the failure to use the problem-solving devices to rebound after you sin. And uh, that's where most people face their first glitch. They don't understand rebound, or if they do understand rebound, they only do it when they come to Bible class, which may not be very often. And they don't think about it during or throughout the day. And I, I say jokingly sometimes that I hold the world record for rebound. And on, on the one hand, that might sound like a joke. Well, you must sin an awful lot. Yes, I do. And so does everyone else. Um, but uh, the reason why I rebound so frequently, or just to name arrogance, is just so that I can make sure uh, that for as long as possible, I'm inside of God's power sphere, and that's the very same way uh, you should be. And instead of justifying yourself uh, before God, you don't have to justify yourself to people, but to justify yourself before God is, uh, uh, in other words, you justify what you've done. I had a right to be angry. You may have been angry. I had a right to react to someone. You may have reacted to someone. I had a right to uh, go out and uh, commit adultery because my wife treated me bad or my husband treated me bad. And uh, so that's a way to justify any action that you uh, take in life that's regarded as the Bible as sinful. And so instead of justifying that sin, saying I had a right to do it or deceiving yourself into a reason why you did it, just admit to God what you've done and to God only as David did when um, he had finally realized that he'd committed adultery and murder and all sorts of sins related to the arrogance complex of sins. And he got uh, right back in line and he said, I named my sins to God and to God alone. And as a result, he was back in fellowship, but he did not have the filling of God the Holy Spirit as we have it today. And yet he was still able to be a man after God's own heart. So we have the ignorance or failure to use the problem-solving devices. Uh, number one, rebound. Number two, the failure to understand the importance of being filled with God the Holy Spirit, which means the failure to understand the importance of being inside of God's power sphere. Uh, the failure of understanding God's promises, the faith rest drill. The failure of understanding a fortiori with greater reason. And what that simply means is, if Jesus Christ could save me uh, from damnation, then how can he not deliver me from whatever situation you're in? And instead of worrying, you utilize the faith rest drill. Uh, for example, if Jesus Christ, you could use a fortiori and say, if Jesus Christ could do the most for me by dying on the cross as a substitute for me, then how can he not also deliver me from a terrible financial situation? Or how can he not deliver me from a terrible relationship situation that you got yourself into? How can he not deliver me from this, that, or whatever a heartache you're going through? And of course he can deliver you, so that's part of the faith rest drill, the Latin a fortiori, meaning with greater reason. Then we have uh, grace orientation and doctrinal orientation. Failure to have grace orientation means you will uh, judge others, become legalistic, and uh, that's why grace become, comes before doctrine. It says in the Bible, you must grow in the grace and in the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace before doctrine, because if you put doctrine uh, first in that equation, you will become legalistic and try to shove that down everyone's throat when it's not your job. It's not even my job. You see, you sit here in freedom, and the people who listen to me via the internet come in freedom and listen. 
I don't force a soul to do anything as far as uh, as Bible doctrine is uh, concerned. Now, I'm a human being, so sometimes I might get pushy and horsey, like a horsey woman, and want to uh, shove something into somebody else's face about how they're failing. But that's my own fault, and then I have to rebound just as you would and keep moving. But uh, I'm a human being, and so are you, so get off your high horse. Grace, see? Grace orientation and doctrinal orientation is next. And you don't have any doctrinal orientation, uh, you're ignorant of it because you have uh, failed in the first place with the protocol. And after I'm finished with the Freedom Series, we're going to 1 John. You say what happened to Acts. Uh, you can hear about what happened to Acts uh, in the other two messages that I gave that you, you weren't able to hear as of yet. And so uh, I'm going to 1 John, and I'm going to uh, teach it in a, a way to where you understand a protocol. And to know, you say, well, is it going to be different from the colonel? Well, it's a different personality, and it will be uh, taught in a different way, but the concept, of course, will be exactly the same, obviously. Otherwise, I would be wrong. And uh, so there is the ignorance of doctrinal orientation, the, the ignorance of a personal sense of destiny. That's where you develop your spiritual self-esteem. That's where you flush out the hypersensitivity toward self, the insensitivity toward others. Then you have, from a personal uh, sense of destiny, you develop personal love for God and impersonal love for all mankind. Impersonal love for all mankind is an extension of grace orientation. And personal love for God plus impersonal love for mankind is the integrity envelope. Then you have the law of love, and there's no law against love. Uh, so the even uh, as far as those who are covenant in their theology, uh, they cannot preach against love, but, but they tried. They tried to teach against Christ's love. But uh, that's the integrity envelope, which is far and above anything that the unbeliever can do, and far and above anything of the Mosaic law. And then you have a plus H, sharing the happiness of God, and that is uh, circumstances don't affect you, just as... Uh, God's happiness is perfect and has gone on forever and ever, and there never was a time when God became unhappy. And in eternity past, God knew that after he, Jesus Christ knew, after he created Satan, and the second member of the Trinity is the creator, after he created Satan, he knew he'd have to eventually, as a result, create human beings, and then as a result of that, die as a substitute for us all. And knowing all that, he... Uh, created these creatures anyway, and uh, he never was unhappy. Unhappy, not even on the cross. And you say, that sounds impossible, but it's not. It was part of the spiritual life. And it even says, for the joy or the unalloyed happiness that was set before me, he disregarded the shame of the cross as found in Hebrews. And so he was happy while hanging on the cross. And that is something phenomenal and something in which you can share the happiness of God. And then, of course, occupation with Christ. And then you are distracted because you are ignorant of these ten problem-solving devices. Then there's the distraction of legalism. Under legalism, uh, the individual assumes that they are very spiritual when actually they are in Christian degeneracy, or under some form of moral degeneracy. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Under this I will describe to you the distraction of legalism. I'll also, in, the, in these verses, you'll see all types of distractions. You'll see the distraction of legalism. You will see the distraction of people. You will see the distraction of PR and PC, that is uh, public relations and political correctness. They had it back then. You'll see the fallacy of it all. And you'll uh, come to understand a, a lot of the things, why I teach the way I teach. You'll understand a lot of things from just Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. I've, we've studied Matthew before, 
many, many years ago. Probably six years ago. But you might not remember Matthew chapter 15. It says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, now what they did was they actually were following our Lord around trying to catch him, trying to catch him doing something that they would consider lawless and as such accuse him. And then finally they found that the disciples were doing something that uh, had become part of their tradition. It wasn't even part of the Mosaic law but part of uh, the traditions that they had come up and with their man-made rules. And then in verse 2, they asked this, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. To them, that was a big deal. But uh, it was none of their business. But Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? So he just flips it right around on them and then he's going to come up uh, with what they had been doing under their own man-made rules and regulations and laws. He says, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your own tradition? For God said, honor your father and, mo and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. He quotes the Mosaic law, which is something they knew very well. In fact, in order to be a Pharisee, they had to memorize the Torah. So they had memorized this. So when Jesus quoted it, they knew exactly what he was talking about. And it was going to be very offensive to them, as we'll see. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, what they did is these Pharisees came up with a system, a religious system that extorts money. And how they did it is they would say, uh, instead of uh, saving up money to care for your elderly par uh, parents, they would simply say, oh, I've devoted this money to God. I don't have to help my elderly, sickly parents. Uh, they can go out on the street for all I care because I've, de and they justify it how? I've devoted this money to God. That's how they justify it, when really they've done no such thing. They've uh, given it to themselves, it's a, you know. And so uh, Jesus catches them in their own man-made rules and says, well, what are you talking about? You are accusing my disciples of breaking a tradition when you break the law by your very own tradition. And this tradition was part of uh, dedicating your money after your death to the temple. Now after you're dead you don't care for the money so it's very easy to do. And then they would say well I don't have to help my father or my mother and uh, I've given all this money to God. And then in verse 6 they are not to honor their father or mother with it and they actually expressly would do this to people and say what you need to do is devote all your money to the temple when you die. So as a result, you are not to help your father, your sickly father, your sickly mo mother with the money. And by doing so, they were breaking the Mosaic Law by their own tradition. And uh, they were a greedy bunch for sure, the Pharisees. But uh, they're no different than a lot of people. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. In other words, they nullified the word of God to honor your father and mother for the sake of a man-made tradition, one that they made up, one that was not part of the Mosaic law whatsoever. Then he calls them a name. Verse 7, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Now our Lord's going to quote more scripture against them. They're seething already. Now he's called them a name. Now he's going to quote scripture. Have you ever heard me do that? Call somebody a name and quote scripture? Or just call people in general a name and quote scripture? 
Well, I'm in good company. Uh, Jesus did it. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. You see, something about Jesus, he didn't care about public relations. He went to the cross, after all. He didn't care about political correctness. And he would stand up to any man because he was the God-man. And he goes and insults them using Scripture. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. There he hit them. And he not only hit them, he hit them with Scripture. He hit them with stuff they had memorized. They'd memorized these verses in Isaiah, and they had memorized the verses, of course, regarding honoring father and mother. So Jesus Christ is chewing them up one side and down another and spitting them out, or vomiting them out, as we studied. And, of course, they're not going to like that at all. How dare this man from Nazareth, very a, uh, a town that would not be, well... Uh, you would uh, say today, you know how Hollywood makes fun of the South. An uneducated area. Uh, or how the big cities make fun of the heartland of America. And the heartland of America is much, much smarter than those in the big city. Just because they're in a big city doesn't mean anything. But they, they were from the big city Jerusalem and they thought they were something. And here Jesus from mere Nazareth who had not been college educated, as they were, uh, he actually, by the point he was teaching here, had no place to lay his head. He said of himself, the, the foxes have dens and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He was homeless. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Now in verse 12, you see the disciples are distracted. What are they distracted by? People. And the legalism of people. So the disciples are concerned. And they just, they can't believe that the Lord just ripped apart the religious elders in such a way. Even though he's the Lord, they were judging him and saying, well, I don't think you should do it that way, is what they were doing. This is what they're saying. They're saying, I would have done it differently. Couldn't you have been a little kinder to those men of God? I mean, why would you? They went into public relations mode and political correctness mode. Well, you just offended this whole group of people. And uh, maybe they could do something for us, and maybe they could do something for your ministry, And even though he's the Lord, but this is how they were thinking. And they weren't thinking straight at all. They didn't really start to think straight until God the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. Then the disciples came to him and asked. They went up to Jesus. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Of course he knew it. He offended them on purpose. He replied, now he's going to give them a parable. Oftentimes the Lord would teach in parables. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. He's saying these are unbelievers. And unless they are planted by believing in Christ, they're going to be pulled up by the roots. Then he says to them, Leave them, they are blind guides. Separate yourself from the legalistic crowd. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Then Peter said, we know Peter, he's always the gregarious one and the First one with a comment. He always talks before he thinks. Uh, but uh, this would be an encouragement to you. Not now, but maybe later. So our Lord, uh, let's look at what our Lord has done so far. 
He has just decimated the Pharisees. He's just ripped them apart and spit them out, chewed them up. And now, Peter said, explain the parable to us. Then in verse 16, are you so dumb? Now, our Lord is talking to Peter. And if you know something about Peter, if you know the history of Peter and all the scriptures related to Peter, he's the most chewed out man in the Bible. He's chewed out by Jesus Christ. He was chewed out by God the Father. He was chewed out by the Apostle Paul. He holds the record for being chewed out by the most important, uh, not only people, but by God the Father himself. I believe Peter's the only one who's was chewed out by God the Father and Jesus Christ, and the Apostle Paul. He was something else. But it should be encouraging to you that, that someone who is something else can make it because P Peter later on became a great apostle and he will receive the crown of righteousness at the Bema while a lot of uh, people just remain stupid. Peter was a plugger and he kept plugging along until he made it. But at this point, he hasn't made it. So if you haven't made it yet, guess what? You need reproof and correction. And our Lord knew what Peter needed. He needed reproof and correction. God the Father knew what Peter needed when uh, Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he was inviting God and Elijah and Jesus Christ in the uh, transformation uh, to all come down in a tent and to spend the night as if God the Father or Elijah would want to spend the tent, spend the night in a tent. And so he was chewed out and, and uh, Peter had his mind on things that were earthly and not on things eternal. So God the Father said, uh, this is my son in whom I, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Are you so dumb? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? So he has to explain it in detail for Peter. You know, are you so dumb? Have you ever heard me say that? Well, maybe not to you personally. But uh, as far as a teaching mechanism, yes. Why? Well, I'm uh, following my leader, Jesus Christ. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? Very descriptive. Verse 18. But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the stream of consciousness, from their thinking. And these defile them, for out of the thinking, the stream of consciousness, come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. So notice our Lord's, uh, how he teaches. First, he says, are you dumb? And then he explains. Are you still so dumb? You see, he had been teaching them for a long time. And then he explains. After he tells them they're dumb. Now, good for Peter, he wasn't too hypersensitive, or he might have just left. Well, this isn't a friendly church, he would say. <laughs> Jesus Christ isn't friendly enough to me. But Peter had humility. And it takes humility to make it in the spiritual life. And if you're distracted, you're not humble. Now, Peter was distracted, but he had the humility to eventually make it. And there was a comedian once, he said, I went to church... And I just, uh, it's not funny what he had to say, but it was leading up to something funny. But I remembered this part of it because a principle comes out of it. He says, I went to church, and uh, I really didn't like it. And the whole time I was in the church, I was looking up at a dude. He was just a man. And I kept saying, well, this guy is talking about this, that, and the other, and he's just a dude. Why do I have to listen to a dude? Just a man. Well, the, the principle that he's just a man is correct. I'm just a man. Why would you listen to me? I'm just a dude. 
Well, God the Holy Spirit gives the gift of pastor teacher at the moment of salvation. And uh, as a result, why does God do that? Why, why does, is there a visible gift of pastor teacher given to a man, not a woman, to a man? Why? Authority. Because you can't learn without having an established authority. Just as when you go to school, you had a teacher who was an authority. You didn't just go to school and read the textbook amongst yourselves, did you? No. You had an authority. Even today, you have an authority in school, the teacher. Even today, in these rebellious times, there's still authority. Bad authority, but authority, nonetheless. And in college, there's all types of bad authority. Liberal professors, communist professors, they're an authority, and they teach from a textbook, or they teach whatever they want, or whatever goofiness they want, but they're the authority. And you learn some academic subject from a professor. Or you learn some sport from a coach, and some other principles of life, or you learn uh, how to play an instrument or how to play in a symphony under a conductor. Just people. Why do you have to listen to those people? Well, they're supposed to be an expert in whatever area they're teaching. And the man with the gift of the pastor teacher is supposed to be an expert in theology in what he is teaching. Now what happens to a lot of pastors is what happens to a lot of politicians. What happened today is called expediency. And Rush Limbaugh said today, and I agree with him, he said, if the Republicans are just going to cave in, why don't they just go home and never come back? What's their use? If they're just going to be a Democrat and go along with Democrat policies, why are they even there? Why don't they just go home? And I agree. But, I want to bring, that's just politics. That's not even meaningful, really. What, it's a more meaningful than some things, but it's not as meaningful as the Word of God, not even close. So let's bring it into the church. There are pastors who know doctrine. There are pastors who used to know doctrine and have gone into reversionism. Or there are pastors who know doctrine and know better, but they've fallen into expediency and become nothing more than a politician. Why? They're distracted. They see the legalist in the audience. And instead of reproving and correcting the legalist, they want to tickle their ears. Why? They get money from them legalists. So they go into expediency, public relations, or they themselves are just want the attention and the praise from man. So they go into all types of goofy activities that aren't uh, related to the Word of God and aren't even a uh, part of their modus operandi as a pastor. Not what the Bible says they should be doing. It says uh, for the pastor, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. First of all, they've got to dedicate their lives to the acquisition of the knowledge of Bible doctrine. And uh, a lot of them have failed in that area. Most pastors have failed in that area, and even for those pastors who have been a workman that is not to be ashamed, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, that is to know dispensations and to uh, teach it in such a way, not to go off on a doctrinal fad. A lot of pastors did that. They went off on a doctrinal fad, especially in the 80s, uh, concerning the the resurrection is near, and it is occurring again today. It always has occurred. That's a big doctrinal fad. It occurred during Lewis Berry Schaefer's day. And I was uh, reading the introduction to his uh, great uh, theological uh, eight-book uh, theological systematic theology, and he began by talking about a, a doctrinal fad. And he says, this book is not for you to go on a doctrinal fad. In other words, to cherry pick what you want out of it, such as eschatology, which deals with the rapture, and uh, then deals with what occurs after the rapture. He says, it's not for a doctrinal fad for you to just teach on one subject constantly, such as the 
resurrection of the church. And then people get into pontificating. Is it going to happen soon? Well, it looks like it might be lining up. They will say, I don't say that. It's always looked as if it was lining up. That's been uh, the whole of history, pretty much. You can go all throughout history, and it looks like it's lined up perfectly uh, for what is going to happen in the tribulation. Oh, you can look at World War II, and under the under World War II, it looked like it was uh, much more likely that it would happen then than it looks like it would happen now. But you don't go by that because the church age is totally separated out from the tribulation. It's separated by the rapture, but there's it's totally separated. It's a completely different dispensation. There is no prophecy in this age except that the rapture will occur at some time. That's all we know. We don't even know when, not even close to knowing when. And people who try to claim it have fallen into er the arrogance of being distracted by a doctrinal fad. So a lot of pastors have been distracted in that way. Or they have gone into public relations. And uh, some of them have even uh, studied arrogance and they know how to work it now. Uh, for example, all you have to do is uh, treat your con well, tickle their ears. Uh, to treat your don't reprove and correct the, your congregation. Never do that. That'll get them upset in a hurry. Just like the Pharisees became upset. But you've got to separate, as our Lord did, the wheat from the tares. And notice, Peter was chewed out. He stayed with the Lord. The Pharisees were chewed out, and they went off mad. The Pharisees were arrogant. Peter was humble. And so the pastor has to chew out in order so in order to get rid of that comedian who might walk in one day and look up and say, that's just a dude. Why should I listen to that dude? Well, you shouldn't. Go home. So he does. Especially if you offend him. And for those who are humble, they will take the reproof and the correction. They might grind their teeth at first, but then they will take it and grow in grace and in knowledge without becoming hypersensitive. And uh, you get dis and the pastors always, uh, lately, are distracted in apostasy because their congregation is in apostasy. They want to, uh, well, I guess, keep their job. <laughs> Especially in these hard times, nobody has money. And it's, uh, if you're going to have a small congregation, which is what more than likely you're going to have if you're teaching doctrine, uh, for the most part, with few exceptions, uh, it's whoever the Lord brings. And uh, as a result, uh, a lot of uh, pastors should just shut down and stop. And what I'm going to say to them is what Rush Limbaugh said to the Republicans. If you're going to act like any other church, why not just go home? Right? If you're not going to teach Bible doctrine, what's your point? What's the purpose? What's the purpose of it all? Go do something else. Get out of it. It's a lot better than being punished. And if you're not being supported because you're teaching the Word of God and reproving and correcting and you say fooey with it, well, you will stand and you just keep going with the doctrine you're on your own. Go it alone. And you will stand in judgment of this apostate nation because you couldn't get a crowd because the people have become so arrogant that they cannot take a little reproof and correction without becoming hypersensitive. That's why I don't accept money. I don't even want that influence around me. I will, uh, as long as I have an income coming in, and I'm fine. I can do this. I can do this while working or shampooing all day or whatever. I have the gift and I've put in my study for many, many years. Sometimes eight hours a day, day by day by day by day by day. Well, that's the distraction that a lot of pastors face. And I just say to you, go home. You say, well, don't they have some type of purpose? If they don't reprove and correct, no, they don't. Just like 
the Republicans in Congress, if they cave in, what's their purpose? When I vote, I vote straight party line because I figure you vote based on principle, not based on the man. And you say, well, don't you get to know each name of the person you're voting for? Hell no, I don't have time for that mess. Do you? Don't lie and say, oh, I, I get to know the man very intimately before I vote. Uh, there are so many things on a ballot to vote for that, uh, and so many people on a ballot to vote for. I mean, what is the point? I and mean, people do this. They vote split ticket. They'll, say, they'll just uh, go through and this guy, oh, that guy, he's handsome. Democrat, bloop. Oh, this guy over here, he said some good things I agreed with. Republican, bloop. You've just canceled out your vote, moron. <laughs> that is, if the, you're voting, that is, if the people in power are principled. But the people in power aren't going to be principled if the people who vote for them aren't principled, and they're not. And we all wag our finger at Washington. Bad, bad Washington. Who sent those people to Washington? Are you so stupid? <laughs> we did! See, we don't have a right to be blaming those people. We sent them there. We're a free country. And that's why democracy doesn't work. We're not a democracy, we're a republic, but we've degenerated into a democracy, and then we degenerated into socialism very rapidly. Then we'll be wiped out. We've already changed as a nation anyway. Not the nation I grew up in. It's just insanity. All the things going on are insanity. We've turned into a police state. There was a guy who liked fishing. He went to school. This is a true story. You might not believe me, but you can look it up on the internet. You can look up anything there. I went to school. He had a tackle box in his car. Tackle box was shut. He had a fillet knife to fillet his fish. So he went fishing after school or over the weekend or whatever. I don't know all the details behind it because uh, they didn't give it uh, when they were talking about the situation. But then the school found out he had a fillet knife somehow. I don't know. They used to do random searches for drugs when... I was in school and they would, uh, since your car was on school property, government property, they could just go through your car at will or ask you to open the door and they'll check it out to check for drugs and uh, you're under the authority of the school and on the school property so that's the way it works. This They found out this guy had a fillet knife and then, well, he not only was he kicked out of school but they brought in a prosecutor to charge him with a Class A felony that would have given him 10 years behind bars for bringing a fillet knife to in his tackle box, the fillet knife he fished with. Now that's crazy. That's psychosis. And that's the authority we're under. Thank you, believers, for your public relations and political correctness. Thank you for being arrogant and not wanting to listen to the Word of God. Thank you for moving away from your first love. Thank you for com becoming enemies of the cross. Thank you for all your shouts of amen and hallelujahs and uh, having your lips close to God, but your heart's far from him. Thank you for being phony because you've destroyed this country. Thank you for being a traitor. Now get with it. Get with Bible doctrine. You want to straighten out this country? Don't get into political activism. Get with Bible doctrine. What we lack is a pivot. What we lack are Pleroma believers who've executed the spiritual life and have gone through all various types of testings and have reached spiritual maturity. And some have gone on and gone to Pleroma. Most of them have gone on to be with the Lord. So we're in a lot of trouble. Wag your finger at Washington all you want. Look in the mirror. Maybe you are the problem. Now, will I get a lot of people teaching that way? Not in an environment of apostasy. No way.
But if you want to uh, teach just as every other church around, what's your point? Go home. I'm saying this so you'll avoid divine discipline. Shut your doors. Get a job. Get a real job. Don't be a politician. There's no room for that in Christianity. And yet that's all it has become. A bunch of expedient people in authority because the people in this country don't understand authority anymore and are rebellious. They're rebellious against God. They've become rebellious against divine establishment principles. Uh, wives are rebellious against husbands. Children are rebellious against parents. Uh, students are rebellious against teachers. There's rebellion all through society, except in one place. That's the military. Rebellion everywhere. Well, you're not going to be rebellious here. I'll pounce on you. And you'll walk out the door or stop listening. That's what I want you to do. Just as our Lord said to these idiots. He chewed them out. And then he said to, the, to his disciples, he gave them a command. Leave them Separate yourself from the blind guides, the legalist. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. So legalism is a distraction, and our Lord says separate yourself from the legalist. Separate from them. Separate, from their, separate from their hallelujahs, their amens, their self-righteousness, their attitude. Shun them! They are the enemies of the cross of Christ. A lot of them don't even believe in eternal security. Jesus Christ will vomit them out of his mouth. They're lukewarm believers, idiots, morons. Separate yourself from them. Well, then there's the distraction of the failure to execute the protocol plan of God. That's, that's fairly much uh, related to the ignorance of the problem-solving devices. And I've gone over in uh, some detail the distraction of Christian service and what that means. And uh, I will end with uh, that. What does that mean? Well, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have two responsibilities. One is related to your priesthood. That's the most important because that's you representing yourself before God. Then there's the ambassadorship. That's you not representing yourself before man, but you representing Christ before man. How do you do that? With his thinking! It's all up here in the stream of consciousness. Not by acting sweet. Jesus Christ didn't act sweet. Not by going through public relations. You might just uh, one day you chew somebody out like the Lord did uh, from your position of authority. So what? It's what you're supposed to do. That is from behind the pulpit. So what? Well, that is uh, the problem. When people put their ambassadorship ahead of their priesthood, you're a priest first. Once you fulfill the function of your priesthood, the function of your ambassadorship will fall right into place. If you put your ambassadorship first, you don't know what anything that's related to your priesthood or you're distracted by your ambassadorship, that is you representing Christ before man, then you fail. You start uh, going along with all the amens and hallelujahs and praise the Lords. You start compromising with people because you can't represent the thinking of Christ before people if you don't have the Bible doctrine that comes from understanding the priesthood, that comes from understanding the royal family honor code, which part of that is privacy. And if you don't understand those things, then don't you dare teach someone else or try to about their ambassadorship. A lot of people get a little doctrine and they think they know a whole bunch and they start wanting to be a teacher. Women really get involved in that. And that's because women are natural teachers. They're very good at teaching 
children. They're horrible at teaching grown men. Horrible. It's not designed for that. You know what that's called when a woman tries to teach a grown man? Or instruct him and reprove him? That's called nagging. Look up 1 Peter chapter 3 to get a dissertation on how not to nag. Well, that's a part of ambassadorship. You are a priest. Represent yourself before God. And you're an ambassador for Christ. Representing Christ before mankind. And how do you do that? Well, I think we just went over Matthew 15 and some of what Christ did. And what did... And if... Uh, our Lord even says later, as we go through 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, you'll find out that uh, our Lord would often say, especially related to the cosmic system, if the world hated me, that is, Satan's cosmic system, if the world hated me, then how will they not much more hate you? I mean, if the world hated the Lord, who was perfect, how is not the cosmic system going to hate us, and we're imperfect? And as soon as we stumble, people are going to stomp on our heads. Especially if you're living inside the divine dinosphere most of the time. Because the cosmic system hates those living inside the of God's power sphere. They look for you to trip and fall. They want it to happen. And then when it happens, they want to bash your head into the... Uh, they want to make it hurt all the more. The only thing they will do is fall under Matthew chapter 7, triple compound discipline. And then the uh, person who's tripped and fall, or, or whoever you're attacking, or whatever you're doing and, and violating their privacy, they'll just get right back up if they understand the spiritual life and move right along under the concept of blessing. Uh, that's another thing related to doctrine. You can know a little bit of doctrine, think you know it all, and then you have a real problem on your hands. Now you're going to be a teacher, are you? Might as well just keep learning. You don't want this job. And what happens with the visible gift, everybody sees that it's visible. They want it because they relate that to visibility and being noticed and recognized and all of that. It's not what it's about. Yeah, you'll be recognized, all right. Our Lord was recognized, and they threw him on a cross. Peter was recognized as a great apostle, and they hung him upside down on a cross. Paul, the greatest apostle ever, was executed by Nero, beheaded. Best way to go. He didn't feel anything. Whack, gone. But executed. My dad said something funny the other day. We did all that work executed the protocol plan of God, went around and did missionary work and all that, and he was, had already won the race and was already going to receive the crown, and then he was martyred, which means he would have received his crown for being martyred. Well, I, that's a joke. I'm sure he was joking. But it, that's true. <laughs> anyway, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom study these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to what we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.